Hello, listeners. I'm Lincoln Harris, co-founder of Aussie Rules Footy in India, and you're listening to A Yank on the Footy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 90 of A Yank on the Footy. I'm Craig Wessels from Sandusky, Ohio, and I'm thrilled that you're listening. Today's club of the episode is the Baronia Hawks of Baronia, Victoria, which is in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. They participate in both footy and netball in the Eastern Footy and Netball League. Here is to wishing the senior coaches of the men's and women's senior clubs, along with the younger groups and the netball clubs, which I know nothing about netball, the absolute best of luck as they continue their season. Go Hawks! Really love your club's logo. It's a very unique one. I really like that a lot. Best of luck as you go forward. I see that uh, at least the men's group is heading into round three already, so hopefully you have a successful year got a great episode for you today. I am so excited to have been able to conduct this interview. Uh, This is somebody who I learned a great deal from as I was falling in love with the game of footy and uh, their efforts on AFL Tonight and as a sideline reporter during games and such just was critical in in my developing an understanding of the game and uh, a relationship between the the media and the athletes and just she, she was just an absolute huge help i can't think of any other way to describe it in terms of getting me uh up to speed on this game so i had the pleasure of sitting down a couple of weeks ago with narrowly meadows who was finishing up her quarantine in uh india as she's getting ready to start uh broadcasting the uh from the studio for the cricket league in India this uh, this time of the year, and she was able to fit me in uh, for about an hour during her her quarantine, and I cannot thank her enough. I think you're going to like this. A lot of laughs, learned a lot, and and I'm just going to say right now before we even get into the interview, if you're not listening to her podcast, you absolutely should be. Now, of course, you should still be listening to mine as well, but I would argue that she might be the best interviewer in the game today. So hopefully you'll sit back uh, and check it out and you'll enjoy it. Don't forget that you can find everything related to this podcast, though, at my new website, yankonthefooty.com. I hope you'll check it out. I hope you'll get up uh, on the mailing list. That way it allows me to get uh, the new episodes sent directly to your email when they come out. They'll, they do show up on the website within about 15 minutes of when I do produce them, but I get them sent out to you even sooner than that. So if you want to get them fresh out of the oven, get signed up on that mailing list, okay? If you like the show and you might want to consider possibly helping me out there and keeping it up and running and uh, maybe expanding it a little bit there, maybe take a look at the Buy Me a Coffee page if you want to help out the show or maybe uh, pick up a t-shirt or a couple of stickers to put on your computer, that sort of thing, at the uh, storefront page, which is on Redbubble. There's a link on the uh, website for that as well. I've had some very generous people uh, recently who've helped out. I cannot thank them enough. It's been absolutely wonderful to see that they uh, that they're enjoying it and that they're wanting to help out. I, um, I have really enjoyed really enjoyed engaging with people recently and the website is starting to take off. And I know it's something that not a lot of people have become accustomed to using because not, not every podcast has its own standalone interactive website, but this, this has got a lot of things going for it that if you haven't checked it out yet, take a peek at it. There might be something there that you, uh, you find interesting. I do have a blog that I keep uh, updating every few days. Uh, Those I do put out onto Twitter as well then and mention those there, but like I said, there's an opportunity there for you to leave voicemails if you've got any kind of an idea for a show or something like that nature. Of that nature, you can go ahead and record a voicemail there. You can uh, you can leave written messages there as well. You can leave a review for the podcast if you're enjoying the podcast. 
you can tell the world about that there. And you can put a review there. Or even if you don't like the podcast, you can put a review up there as well. Okay? Hopefully you'll let me know why it is that you don't care for it. But uh, I really do appreciate all of you who have interacted with me and have reached out. Okay? And it's, it's been absolutely fantastic. Now, I'm going to be releasing this uh, on the 25th. And I know that this is Anzac Day. And I did a little... Anzac uh, Day tribute at the end of my live episode on Tuesday, but I, I hope all of you have an enjoyable day. I hope all of you stay safe. Remember the heroes who have defended the great nation of Australia and those who have defended the great nation of New Zealand as well. You know, in the last five years that I've been following this game, I, I cannot... I cannot even begin to imagine the generosity that the people that I have interacted with regarding footy have shared with me. Just some absolutely wonderful people helping me learn about the game, engaging with me, uh, just having conversations back and forth that, uh, you know, as I tell my wife, I said, you know, other than, other than her and other than my students at school and my, my mom, I, you know, I think I talk to more people in Australia than I do here in my hometown. Okay, I, I can tell you that. I know I certainly talk to more people in Australia than I do my next-door neighbors. I don't see one of my neighbors very often. I, I, I like to joke with the other neighbors around the neighborhood that I think he works for the CIA or he's a spy of some sort because he's hardly ever there. I think he's out on missions all the time. I don't know if that's the case, though, or not, though. I think his family's from town here. But, ladies and gents, sit back. Enjoy the episode, the interview with uh, Nearly Meadows. I really think you're going to like it. She is an absolute delight. She is a, a credit to sports announcing. You know, I would I would love to see her back involved with footy again, but uh, you know that's that's something that you know we'll have to see what happens going on in the future. I you know she has she has certainly made a name for herself internationally, whether it's being involved in here in the U.S. for the Super Bowl or calling cricket in uh, in India or last year as she did in Dubai. And it's just it's just fascinating and, and a lot of fun to see how things are going with her. So I wish her nothing but the best. I hope you sit back and enjoy the uh, the podcast, okay? And like I said, you know, check out the website, yankonthefooty.com. You can find the podcast still at all of your favorite uh podcast hosting sites but it's going to be there as well and you can you know you can copy a link to that on your phone you can link to it and listen to the podcast there if you want to but i'd love to hear from you i'd love to know what you think okay i mean if you haven't come on on one of the uh live episodes i had a handful of people tune in live the other day i didn't get anybody on the air didn't seem like anybody was really ready to jump on there but you know each week I've begun doing a live episode on Tuesday night, my time, Wednesday, right around lunchtime in Melbourne. And, uh, you know, I will be putting out a link for that as soon as I have that set up and ready to be done later on that evening for me. But I'd love to have you engage and come on and listen in and, you know, give me some comments or come on and talk about your club and what you see going on. Yeah, I gave you my tips the other day that... Uh, I'm wondering if I should be changing any of them up because, you know, of course, the uh, the MASH unit that seems to now be the uh, the Cats is going to be missing Patty Dangerfield for at least a month. Uh, maybe they're going to have Jeremy Cameron back this week. I've heard some conflicting things on that. But, of course, the, the Eagles are coming to town. And they're going to be without Josh Kennedy. So I don't know if that levels the playing field at all, but I think that's going to be a very close game. And, and the Cats, I think, are going to you know, love the club, love being a Cat supporter. I don't know if they're going to scuffle or not in the uh, in the coming weeks. I hope not. I hope I get proved wrong on that. And I hope they rise to the occasion. But having been a Cleveland Browns fan for a half century, it's kind of become part of my DNA to think the worst as far as sports go. So I hope I'm wrong. I hope they prove me wrong. I hope I hope somebody, one of them gets on their social media and calls me out and says, Oh, ye of little faith. Okay, folks, enough rambling here to get going. Sit back, enjoy the episode. 
I'll come back and close it out after we finish up. So here's my interview with Narrowly Meadows. Enjoy, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Craig Wessels back from a yank on the footy, and I am absolutely delighted to be joined by my guest today. Five years ago, I fell in love with Australian football, and my guest played an integral part in develop my under, developing my understanding and appreciation of that game. And I would argue that it's one of, if not the greatest game on the planet. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Nearly Meadows to the podcast. Ma'am, thanks so very much for coming on. I appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon. Thank you so much for having me and for your kind words. I, I must admit, you're probably the first American that's got my name right first time. So <laughs> you must have tuned in over the years. Oh, I have. I definitely have. I most definitely have. And I, I panicked yesterday because I, I, w- I was following Twitter and I'm noticing a bunch of people talking about the, uh, the time change in Australia last night. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, is that going to screw up our our interview time and I was like wait a minute she's in India she's not she's not in Australia right now so didn't have to worry about that but uh, didn't have to worry I'm one of the strange people that have actually gotten on a plane and traveled uh, overseas in this uh, environment so yeah in Mumbai at the moment and you've done that you've done that several times I mean you have you have definitely kind of you know poked COVID in the eye and said you know what I'm still going to get my job done despite the fact (laughs) that you're around yeah I was um I was t- talking to somebody the other day that in the last 18 months I've managed to still get to Croatia, Vietnam, the US, the UAE and now India but only two of those have been since COVID hit so well actually no I was in the US covering the Super Bowl and that was when COVID was kind of just mm-hmm. sort of sneaking into the vernacular mainstream um so yeah and then I did the UAE uh last year for the same tournament that I'm here for now which is a cricket tournament which Americans know nothing about so I am um, gonna ask you about that though yeah so I did the UAE last year and with Australia every time you go overseas I mean you have to get an exemption to leave the country at the moment and every time you come back you have to do mandatory two weeks of hotel quarantine so I've done a week on the way out and then two weeks on the way back so by the time I finished the tournament I would have done uh, six weeks in um, hardcore hotel quarantine so I'm getting pretty good at it so are are the uh, I heard horror stories about the hotel quarantine in Australia um, where there was you know the meager supplies being dropped off at the rooms and that sort of thing. Have you faced anything of, of, of that type of a situation? I've been really, really lucky because um, I've gotten really nice hotels um, each time that I've done quarantine. So I, I feel like I'm due a, a bad hotel, but <laughs> look, the food is, it's, kind of like eating airplane food for two weeks but I feel like hotel quarantine is all a mindset thing and as long as you go in with the right mindset you can handle it um Mm -hmm. and I'm pretty good with that sort of stuff so the food wasn't ideal in Australia um but I also didn't want to get uber eats or anything like that because I figured you know like suck it up like it's still fine it's still enough food and Um, I just think people were in worse off positions. So I felt like it would be pretty entitled of me if I went and ordered extra food on top of what I was already getting and, um, and things like that. So, and, and the same sort of here in India that, um, yeah, like they, they bring enough food. I don't need to order in for a minute <laughs> outside, no. like just suck it up. <laughs> I, I heard you mentioning on another, uh, discussion you had with someone that you were working on some university studies as well are you working on your master's degree right now then or are you um no that was just during COVID because in okay. Melbourne um Victoria and Australia we were all in lockdown for I mean the best part of six months and it was one of the harder lockdowns in the world so it was mm-hmm. um basically 23 out of 24 hours a day confined to your um to home you could only go out to walk um and that was pretty much it so um, and it was one of the harder ones for a, a long period. So uh, definitely other places in the world did it, um, did harder lockdowns, but ours was one of the, the tougher ones. Um, so yeah, during COVID, I decided, cause most of my work that I'd lined up in 2020 was all overseas. So a lot of that just fell through immediately. I was supposed to be in the States a lot working for ESPN Australia, doing the NBA, um, final series and the U S open tennis and things like that. So that all fell away when COVID happened. So, I um, 
picked up basically it was a, like a six month condensed course that the Australian government put out through universities when COVID hit um, and because I have a, a interest in, in mental health basically my mum was a psychologist mm -hmm. and the podcast that I do is a lot of mental health um, so yeah just did six months of mental health and counselling okay. so that got me through last year and made me okay. feel like I was achieving something well and and, and that actually is gonna is gonna pay off in spades for you when it comes to the podcast that you're doing because you know it's uh it is it, whether you are a a fan of australian sports or not i think it's definitely one that just for the 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 human the humanity of it i think is something that that anybody that's interested in that sort of thing should be should be willing to check out and listen to yeah and it's uh i think it's terrific and, and i yeah i know that you you came over and did the super bowl in 2019 uh 2020 with uh that was the one that pat mahomes won um yeah and it's what's what's been interesting is and this is like i guess this might explain how immersed i am in 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 footy and and how you've helped with that for the last not this past year of course but the previous three super bowls i've turned down the 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 television broadcast here and listened to gerard waitley's call on sen so <laughs> i mean it's just to, to get his his vantage point on it, you know, and, and, and you know, he's, he's working with uh, the dad of one of the, the, the best receivers to ever play the game here as well. And Larry Fitzgerald, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm all in. And the funny thing is I've never seen a game in person before. Wow. Uh, never I have, seen a game in person. I have oh, never seen a game in person before. Them. Yeah. So, you know, we have the USAFL here in the States. I'm hopefully going to get out and, you know, see some of the amateur contests this summer just to, to kind of say, okay, now I now I can say I've seen it in person. I mean, it, I was I was eight months into doing the podcast before I'd actually seen a Sharon in person. So, wow. <laughs> so it was a uh, yeah. You you came to the states and you you did some uh, you did some school work here at the University of Tennessee as you were as you were doing your your undergrad work. Is do you have a lot of orange in your wardrobe? <laughs> Um, I've still got I've still got some of the UT orange, that's for sure. But it was funny actually because obviously the deep south and in, in Tennessee and um, we had one um, class where they basically said, put your hand up if you think that somebody's pronouncing something wrong. And um, <laughs> you know, there was a bunch of different words. My my hand was basically up the entire time, but particularly with orange. Uh -huh. orange i'm like there are two syllables it's orange it's not orange <laughs> well it's uh or or orange i i lived in georgia for a couple of years yes so i'd get <laughs> i'd get those and i worked in the restaurant business i'd get those uh those calls where people would say you know i'd like an orange soda but no ice you put too much damn ice in my orange soda uh so <laughs> i'd get that a lot yeah when i <laughs> When I lived in the States, I got really used to spelling my name, but even spelling my name um, didn't really work because I didn't understand my accent with N-E-R-O-L-I. So I basically had to go N-E-R-O-L-I. <laughs> and then they got it every time, first time. Yeah, yeah. So is there anything, you know, I know you come back to the States with, you know, when when the jobs, when the jobs require, but required, is there anything that... Uh, when you touch down in the U.S., yeah, you know, just from a like a a meal standpoint or something that maybe isn't typical in Australia, that you go, okay, this is this is something I missed from my time at Tennessee. Oh wow, that's funny. I mean, it's just it's more the size of the meals than anything it, that it, that is so different. Um, but I mean, I put on ten kilograms when I lived there wow. for six months. <laughs> I came home and and everyone talks about the freshman 15 I put it on in my in my senior year but I came home and pushed my um suitcase to my dad and just went I had a whale of a time <laughs> but, um yeah so I yeah it was quite funny but no food wise I wouldn't say I mean I love pretzels the big big breaded pretzels that you get um they're pretty great but otherwise it, it was more the experience um okay. And also, I mean, I drank more in, in that six months than I had the rest of my life cumulative, which was kind of funny because I'd only turned 19 over in the States. So uh -huh. I clearly wasn't a legal drinking age in right, the States. Right. But in Australia, it's 18. And I mean, I moved out of home at 17. So it was actually quite funny that 
um, I had to use a fake ID in in the states, but all the frat parties and all that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff that goes on in um, at, at college, yeah, it was it was a good time. It was good well, fun. With with the fake ID, then did you have to apply a, a fake accent to that? Well, no, because <laughs> this is actually quite funny. The fake ID was um, from a, a a friend of mine who was also going to UT, who she was from Estonia, okay, which. With all due respect, a lot of Americans don't even know Australia. So <laughs> it was when I delivered an Estonian pass, uh, driver's license, they had no idea where that was from. So they really didn't, you know, I could have told them it was a state in Australia and they would have bought it. So um, especially in a small, small town, Tennessee. So yeah. yeah, I didn't have any issues with the Estonian driver's license, except for when um, I tried to use it on campus once and one of the guys was like, uh, I'm in a class with Anneli and you're not Anneli. So <laughs> other than that, it was fine. Were, were you were you able to return the ID to her or did he return it? Uh, no, I was able to <laughs> He was fine with it. I'm like, Anneli knows I've got it. Like, you know, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's... Uh... I have to ask, yeah, I listened uh, earlier this week to you were a couple of years ago, you were on a, uh, you were on an, uh, an interview with um, Will Anderson. And I have yeah. to, I have to ask you this. I, I've not watched it yet, but have you finished Game of Thrones yet? I have finished Game okay. of Thrones, yeah. Okay. I mean, if I had not known what was coming, I probably would have saved it for hotel quarantine in 2020 yes, yeah. and 2021. But who who was to know? And I already left it like eight years or something crazy, whatever it was, four years after it actually had come out. Um, so yes, I have finished Game of Thrones now. So what what has been your what has been your your hotel binge series that you have watched? Or... Do you know what this time? Um, I've actually just been working on my podcast and doing tournament okay. prep. So I've kind of been working 10 plus hours a day. Yeah. Um, so I actually haven't really watched that much um, TV. And when I have, I've sort of been watching live sport. Um, I also, I get to the habit in quarantine. I, I make sure I do at least 10,000 steps a day. So I do laps around my hotel yep. room, which a lot of people think I'm crazy for. <laughs> and um, and the AFLW um, Fremantle captain, Cara Antonio, she gives me workouts to do each time as well. So I kind of stay pretty busy with with all of those sort of things. Um, so I haven't really been binging too much this time around, I've, I've got to admit. Um, so, yeah, I've actually, I've been quite good on that front. Good deal. Well, you don't need a fake ID anymore either, though. So you've got that. <laughs> Unfortunately not. I'm, <laughs> I'm well and truly of age. <laughs> so how did the, uh, how did the, the, the gig with the Indian Premier League come about? I mean, that's a that's a, that's a pretty significant jump to, you know, I'm covering, well, covering a game that you're obviously familiar with, but, you know, covering it, you know, outside of the, outside of the, the, the country of Australia, how did that come about? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've covered cricket for pretty much my whole career. Like I've always loved cricket. Um, and I've, I've covered a lot of cricket for 16 odd years now. Um, and covering cricket, from Australia, a lot of Indians saw the work that I did. Um, and I think they always just appreciated my approach that I smile a lot. I'm, I'm very happy to be there. You know, I've, I've never pretended to be a cool kid that, that thinks I'm too cool to be somewhere. Like I'm very open with how much I love my job and enjoy my job. And I think that came across on screen. Um, and yeah, the Indian audience um, appreciated, I think that just the sheer joy and love of cricket that I have. So um, it was uh, basically just a, an email um, out of the blue at the start of last year that okay. uh, asked if it was when I was covering the Super Bowl, actually, that, um, yeah, Star Sports got in touch with me and asked if I would be interested in being one of their hosts for the Indian Premier League, which was due to be this time last year. And then obviously that got put back six months for COVID. But, yeah, it was just an email out of the blue and, um I actually teared up when I got that email because it was such a significant um, opportunity for somebody that has loved cricket like I've loved it my entire life. Um, and cricket was one of the first things that I loved as a kid that I remember being a little girl saying to my dad, um, you know, what's LBW, um, which is like before wicket, which is a way of getting dismissed. But 
I had such a, um, a love for it that I found myself asking my dad, you know, about the rules and, you know, I was only sort of, I don't know, six, seven, eight at the time. And that was when my dad realized that I had a real love of sport as well. And, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that was pretty cool. So we used to go outside and play classic catches all the time. And it wasn't cricket wasn't around for girls to um, to play where I grew up. Um, I wish it was, you know, and footy the same. But um, yeah, always love cricket. So yeah, to be doing this job, like I say, this is the second time that I've done it now. But it's, I mean, it's pretty crazy coming from a country of only sort of twenty five million to you know, um, basically 600 million people watch the IPO around the world. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's a massive, um, massive audience. So it's, yeah, it's pretty special to be a part of it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, they had their finals in Dubai though, did they not? Yeah, it so, was they... in, so I was based in UAE last time um, because of the COVID situation, mm-hmm. they decided to have it in the UAE um this time around they're having it in India things were looking really good in India not so long ago and unfortunately the second wave has hit and it's you know it's pretty scary at the moment um you know 90 plus thousand cases a day you know something that you know obviously from the states really Mm -hmm. well so um hopefully they can they can get through the tournament you know with the biosecure bubbles and and no issues um but we'll have to wait and see so you're pretty much going to be sequestered you're you're going to be Cricket grounds, hotel, hotel, cricket grounds. Yeah, not even cricket grounds. This time around, I'll be just studio. So I'll be oh, hosting okay. um, from the studio and heading to the to the hotel. So it'll be a very strict biosecure bubble. So it's not even a tournament bio bubble. There are, there are bubbles within the tournament. So um, different teams are in different bubbles, different broadcasters. Um, you've got broadcasters that are at the venues and then you've got broadcasters that are just at the studios. So it's pretty strict. So hopefully we don't have any um, issues, fingers crossed. So in this regard, you know, they might have taken a page from what, what the AFL did last year. I think a lot of competitions around the world probably learned a lot from them. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of a moving, yeah, moving face the whole whole time there in the AFL. But I mean, in Australia, we've, you know, we've never had the numbers that that other countries mm-hmm. have had. And you know, we're really grateful for that. Like I said, we're, it's very strict on even you have to get an exemption to leave Australia, let alone to come in. So, um, yeah, we've, we've been really lucky. Melbourne was the hardest hit. And, and at the peak of that, we were only doing sort of 700 cases a day in Victoria. Um, so even, you know, that compared to what the rest of the world is, we're, we're very, very fortunate. Okay. So as you, as you mentioned, you know, cricket is something that's kind of out of the purview of, of Americans. It's not, you know, we, we, we hear them in our backyard making lots of noise in the summertime. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I did an interview with a guy, uh, an American, a couple of months ago, and he was like, so tell me a bit about your career. And I'm like, well, basically, I cover two sports that you know nothing about. <laughs> well, I've, I've got I've got a fairly decent handle on one of them. And I and I'm, I'm at the point right now, I'm, I'm at the point right now where I'm, you know, with with baseball, you know, kind of butting up against footy. You know, I'm looking for something in the wintertime as well. I'm not a huge NBA fan. Uh, I don't think I've watched an NBA game in, well, since LeBron was still in Cleveland, quite frankly. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, but it, it was interesting though, last season, I, I think, um, and you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think Americans got a much bigger taste of Aussie rules um, than ever before because we were one of the only sporting codes mm-hmm. happening in the globe at that time. Yeah, they... Um, so I think, yeah, I think the NRL, um, rugby league, and and um, and Aussie rules were sort of right, going right. out to the to the states, yeah, weren't we they? Were, it's really only five sports. We were getting usually at least seven of the games yeah. here each week, uh, and this year, well, dare I say it, crickets, uh, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the AFL has not reached any sort of a uh, uh, an agreement with with Fox Sports here in the states or with ESPN to carry any game. So there have been none so far through the first three rounds. And I've been every day I'm on Twitter kind of just poking at them. Have you had a meeting yet? Do you know the phone numbers? <laughs> yeah, here's the phone numbers in case you need to talk to each other. You know, and I've got the, the watch AFL app, which, you know, lets me watch, you know, internationally, but uh, yeah, this is a, a huge marketplace for the game to, in, in my opinion, you know, we're, we're a, we're a country that, that tends to, you know, with, with college football, with the NFL, we, you know, we, we tend to gravitate towards 
contact sports, that type of thing. And once once people see this game, they they generally get pretty fascinated by it. And I and I think that they've kind of missed a big opportunity right now. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's an amazing sport and it's, you know, it's a 360 sport, which is what confuses mm-hmm. a lot of people when they first tune in. They don't understand the 360 nature that you really, as far as contact sports go, it's pretty much, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but it's pretty much the only sort of contact 360 sport there is. Um, you know, Gaelic footy is about the closest thing, but yeah. um, they don't really tackle each other. So yeah, it is It is definitely unique, but I think the biggest problem with um, getting it out to the world is, and, and they've tried different ad- adaptations in Australia of playing on rectangular fields and stuff like that. But the biggest issue with getting it out to the world is just space, mm-hmm. sheer space to right, play. Right. Um, right. And I think Americans don't really understand how damn big a footy field is. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing about cricket is cricket and footy fields are, are pretty similar in size, depending in, in which sort of country you're playing in. But so they can share venues, um, whereas you don't have either of those sports. So right, just right. having the facilities to have these giant ovals to play AFL on or play Aussie rules, sorry, Aussie rules is the sport, AFL is the code um, or the league. Um but yeah, it, it's sort of hard to to take it anywhere in the world. But they, you know, they play their games in China um, once a year in the last few years, but obviously pre-COVID. Um, so yeah, they're trying to take it to the world, but mm-hmm. it, it's kind of hard. Well, I'm, I'm yeah, and then there's there's about fifty clubs here in the states that are playing the game, and you know, there's a big push right now what they're calling footy five thousand. They're trying to get five thousand people playing in the United States, and I and I talk to somebody down in the Dallas area who's starting up a second team there and they said you know it's kind of a a tall task he said because we have 3,000 people playing rugby just in the Dallas Fort Worth area and they're trying to get 5,000 across the country playing footy I mean yeah they they just haven't marketed it terribly well because they would put you know they would have a game on but I I never saw a single ad saying hey this game is going to be on and I think I think a a weekly hour long, like a prime time here highlights show saying, Hey, here's what's going on would be a a step in the right direction to kind of draw some people in. Put it together. Yeah. That would have to be a podcast because they're not putting this mug, (laughs) not putting this mug on television. That's not happening. (laughs) That'd be, that'd be a gig for you to have. That would be, (laughs) that's not, that's not one I'm having there. So, you know, as somebody who is is contemplating getting into or, or starting to take a look at cricket, uh, where, where should I begin? What advice I mean, do you have? Is, it's, it's the same as footy. It's it's so different and mm-hmm. so bizarre. I mean, it's kind of like baseball ish, but Americans can't get their head around cricket because it's like particularly Test cricket. Um, because it can go for five days and you still don't necessarily have a result. And Americans just think that that's just the wackiest thing in the world. And <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many quirky things about cricket that I just absolutely love. Like one that I always tell people is, you know, the substitute fielder, which basically a substitute fielder doesn't have to be from within your actual team. You can just rope in someone from a lower league or whatever um, <laughs> to be the substitute fielder in test cricket. And I think that's the greatest thing ever. So in some of the best stories are those sort of weird things. Like, you know, the Australian team once used their masseuse to be the substitute fielder, for example. Mm. And he, had, he was actually quite a handy cricketer, but well, he had still, pretty good hands. Like, you imagine he, any other sport yeah. when you just bring in the masseuse <laughs> Field. he had good and hands I just love that yeah he I had think good... it's just one of the most bizarre things and um yeah it brings me a great deal of joy just to think about that but basically cricket is fascinating to me because I'm a storyteller and um in a, it's essentially an individual sport in a team game and so the reason why test cricket is called test cricket is because it is a test it goes over five days you know you're having mental battles with yourself against the opposition um and I, I just love um, that, yeah, the way that that um, transpires, I guess. And, and T20 cricket is basically 20 overs each. Um, and that's what, what I'm working on at the moment, the Indian Premier League. So it's a compact version of, 
of um of test cricket so it's it's sort of like much more exciting and Mm -hmm. um explosive and all those crazy sort of aerial um feats on display so yeah there's different formats and I think Americans much would much prefer the t20 style of things but um yeah I mean I I love cricket and the time frame of those the time frame of the t20 is much more condensed i think it's what a couple of hours you can usually finish up one of those yeah it's basically like three hours okay um yeah for for a t20 um maybe a little bit longer but yeah basically it's pretty yeah. you know compact it's more compact than a baseball game isn't yeah. it like i mean how no, baseball's is- baseball's Great roughly baseball. that as well but and i and i think unfortunately our attention span here in the united states is waning you yeah. know, ba- baseball is you know, soccer has begun to make some serious headway. You know, we've got international soccer here. We've got, you know, a soccer league here in the U S and baseball has kind of, yeah. it's kind of fallen off a little bit because it, it mean, lasts so I, long. I like baseball, but the times that I've um, invested time to watch it or gone and watch it live in the States, it's just a lot of nothing time. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of just faffing about. Whereas I feel like if they took that more sort of 2020 cricket approach uh-huh. where it's, you know, action, 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 it would be a lot more palatable. But um, I like, I appreciate baseball, but um, it is interesting, especially when you've watched T20 cricket to go back and watch just a, you know, a, a traditional baseball game, how much it does seem to sort of just slow down. Well, you know, you mentioned, you know, you being a storyteller and, and that's where, you know, if you're, if your baseball team has a really good radio commentary team, I mean, they're doing the same thing in game. I mean, and they, you know, they are, they are, they are great at weaving those stories into, into the games. And, you know, for example, the Los Angeles Dodgers had a gentleman who retired, I think two years ago, and he was, you know, he, he'd been announcing Dodgers games for over 65 years and just you know was just a fantastic storyteller and he had such a wide you know variety of of things to delve upon and he still has you know to this day still has all of his faculties and just was absolutely just mesmerizing to listen to yeah so i want to um i want to move into to footy a little bit and i know you're a Fremantle supporter and i've not yeah. watched i've not watched the game over and, and the way you became a Fremantle supporter i thought was really interesting because yeah you know, you decided you wanted to see them win once in a while in the Western Derby. Yeah, which is... <laughs> yeah, my entire family is West Coast Eagles supporters. And I was first a West Coast Eagles supporter because Fremantle didn't exist. Um, and then Fremantle came along and I didn't switch over straight away, but I just, they were the massive underdogs in every, what we call a Western Derby between mm-hmm. West Coast and Fremantle. And I just wanted Freo to win one. So I figured if I wanted them to beat West Coast, then I was a Fremantle supporter. So yeah. my theory on, on teams is you get to choose once. Once you've chosen, that's it. So I was West Coast, but I didn't choose West Coast. That mm-hmm. was just my family's right, choice right. for me. Whereas Fremantle, I chose that. Yeah. Um, so now I'm, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm not leaving. But uh, yeah, it was, we had one year where we only won two games and the first win was 17 rounds into the Mm. season and I it felt like a damn premiership up against (laughs) Hawthorne so I was like you know what like this is this is my team I'm sticking with them and I know I'm going to be one of those sort of 85 year old women going out to the preliminary final training session and being like oh this is my team I never thought I'd see the day but um it'll be worth the wait so I'm patient I'm gonna hotel quarantine yes yeah, I, and I, I have to, I have to say, yeah, when I did my my ladder predictions this year, I had Frio playing finals this year. Really, I, I did. I, I had them. I, I had them in the number eight spot, and it was part. Well, I, you've already answered my follow up question that I was going to say. Convince me, <laughs> as, convince me as to whether I was I made a right or a wrong call there, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought I thought from a defensive good young talent that I didn't think we were going to be playing finals this yeah. year. So. I thought defensively, I, they were one of the better defensive clubs in the comp last year, and they just had to figure out how to put basically another goal and a half on the scoreboard, and they would have won a handful of more games. It hasn't happened well, this year. <laughs> that right there is pretty much Fremantle summed up in our history. So, um, you you know something. <laughs> now the. Uh, 
the AFLW season is is over. I don't I don't know. Do you know? Are there any rules that uh, would prevent Kira Bowers from actually playing in the men's comp? Because I'm th- I think she's good for at least six eight tackles a game. Uh, <laughs> in the men- no, I I had a radio interview recently where I had to do a Fremantle um, preview season preview basically. And they they asked me as the final question, what's the one piece of advice you would you would give um, to the team? And I'd say just watch the girls and do whatever they're doing because they actually win. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, and they yeah they they fell to Melbourne last week, but they but they have they were. Well, we got robbed last year because unfortunately with the women's comp, um, Fremantle were undefeated and we were mm-hmm. well on our way to winning their club's first ever premiership. And then they canceled the entire season because of COVID. So unfortunately they didn't, they didn't do a final series for the women like they did for the men. So I'm still a bit bitter about that. Do you think, and that was, you know, you think about what they did with getting the men's comp back up and running. Do you think they could have or should have done that with the women's comp? I think the moment that they knew that things were going to be compromised, they had two weeks that they could have just stopped the competition mm-hmm. and said, right, this is the ladder. Um, let's just go into straight into finals mode. Um, or even these are the two top teams. Let's play a grand final. Yeah, it, it was still compromised, obviously, but everything was compromised. Right, and right. I, I feel like having, when you had two clear teams that had been winning all season, just have it, you know, have a grand final between them. Um, and that's better than just stopping a season and never finishing it. Yeah. I well, think. Watching them, watching them play was just, to me, it was a lot like, uh, and I think I described this in one of my discussions earlier this year. It was, it was like watching Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first Terminator film is they were just methodical, just, you know, mm-hmm. the way they played defense, they just, they just were swarming on people. And it, it was, it was fun to watch quite frankly. And, yeah. and I, and I'm 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 hoping that it's beginning to gain the traction that it deserves. I really do. Yeah, let's hope so. I mean, for many years, women either couldn't play at all or were forced to give up at 13 years of age. So this is the last couple of years of draft picks is the first group of girls who were never forced to give up the game. So right. that the quality is only going to go up exponentially from here. Yeah, and I you know there was a arguably a bit of a hiccup last year because they added four new clubs and I don't know I don't know if they had I don't know if they had four new clubs of AFLW talent ready to go out on the grounds but you know this year this year it's definitely I think moved it's moved in the right direction and I I think I watched probably 85 percent of the games this year you are dedicated I'm impressed I'm I'm Hey, we haven't even started talking about Australian television yet. Okay, we haven't even we haven't even dug we haven't even dug into Mystery Road or the Circuit. You know, we haven't you know, yeah, you know, we haven't dug into those things yet. You know, Jack Irish. You know, I more than I have. <laughs> hey, that's why that's why I'm not going on television to talk about the game. Do you know what you need to watch? Have you watched the Moody's? The Moody's. I have not. I was actually going to ask you for a a recommendation so that. Okay, so Aussie Aussie humor. This is from a few years ago now. Okay. So it starts with a, a moody Christmas, and then there's a second series called The Moody's, and you need to watch that because it's become sort of a tradition of, of Australians to watch every Christmas. They sit down and they watch a moody Christmas, and the reason why I'm giving that a plug that is all true. But my brother is the lead in that. So okay, there you go. Okay, I. Uh... I I, uh, I did something strange this Christmas this past Christmas Eve. I watched V for Vendetta. I <laughs> I'm not sure why. I just I pulled it off the shelf and thought, yeah, this will be the new what? Christmas movie. Uh, <laughs> so, so for the last couple of years, you have been or for the last couple of seasons. You're now into your second season. You've been doing a uh, a podcast yourself, and and I and I'll be honest with you. I I think that you are. I think you're one of the top interviewers out there. I, I really do. And, and I, and I, and I was wondering, you know, it, for those of you who have not listened your, your show is called ordinarily speaking, which is a dynamite name. I mean, way, way, to, way to actually put, way to put the name, you know, to put your name to work there, or maybe <laughs> for those of you in Tennessee, it's not spelled the way you think. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, the whole idea here is about resilience in sport. And I've, I've not, 
I've not dug into the netball players. That's something I, I don't, that's one I've, I've seen cricket. I kind of have a little bit of an idea. Netball, I just, I don't even know. I don't have a clue. There's no it's backboard. There's no. possible without the dribbling. Yeah. I mean, is there, is there a lot of running involved in it or is it, is it. Yeah. A lot, a lot of running. You're only allowed in certain sections, but it's basically okay. possible okay. without the dribbling. Okay. So, you know, you've had, you've had guests on from a multitude of different sports and photographers and that type of thing as well. And you've, you have allowed them to use this, this, uh, soapbox if you will or this avenue is kind of a uh, a catharsis to go ahead and get things off their chest to allow them to explore and to share the the just how human they are because again you know you you look at people who are professional athletes and and sometimes we don't look at that we don't look at them as being human and mm-hmm. you know one of the arguments i've made about australian sports is that to me from what i have seen footy players seem to be much more approachable than say you know you're not going to find lebron you're not going to run into lebron james at a 7-eleven picking up a gallon of milk because he forgot to bring milk home okay um you know you you might find you might run into you know the player from your favorite club at the coffee shop or something like that and just kind of wave and say hey how you doing that sort of thing you know because they they haven't necessarily they haven't priced themselves out of the sphere that that normal people are involved in so and, yeah, and- I think we're, we're, it's culturally very different too. Like having worked in the states and lived in the states, uh, there's something really freeing about uh, the way that it is in the states. To be honest, because you know people, you know LeBron James says I'm the best in the world, and and that's kind of cool. Like the honesty um, is kind of cool. But in Australia, we have this thing called tall poppy syndrome, where we tend to cut people down a little bit if they get too ahead of themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so even the elite athletes, they'll, they'll get sort of chopped down with banter or whatever you want to call it pretty quickly if they get, if that, you know, they start making statements like that. So as a journalist, like sometimes I wish that they were as honest um, as, as Americans were, but it's just culturally very, very different. So as you say, like people, it, it is, um, they are more approachable in, in many ways, um, but yeah, it, like it comes with, with pros and cons, I think. Right, right. Oh, yeah, I wasn't saying it was necessarily a good thing for the athletes there. I'm just saying it, that they tend to be there. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm just saying like I kind of like the honesty yeah. that exists in the States. As right, well. yeah. So do you think, what led you to, to doing this? And, I, and I, I was wondering if it had anything to do with maybe your mom's background. Did this kind of stem from your mom's career where you thought, you know what? I have an avenue to allow people to kind of be able to express themselves a little bit here that, that maybe other people haven't taken. Yeah. So my mom's a psychologist and, um, and so I've, I sort of joke, I've been self-analyzing since I was five years old. (laughs) Um, but I was brought up with really, um, handy life skills of, you know, knowing how to reframe and, you know, the power of mindset and, um, and a lot of those sort of things. And, and also, there, so there was a show that used to be from um, from the UK back in the day. It was like a police show. And um, my mum used to watch it all the time. And I would, you know, want to know who the goodies and the baddies were. And I would get disappointed in the baddies. And then mum would say things like, yes, but you don't know what they went through as a child. <laughs> so, <laughs> I couldn't even watch, you know, a show like The Bill or whatever, you know, NCIS or whatever um, without my mum sort of, pointing out that you know people do things for a reason and understand before judging and you know those sort of things so I always had very much an interest in in mental health and why people do things and why they are the way that they are and all across my career I've I've definitely um used that or or taken an interest in that and tried to do more in-depth interviews and really um, understand, you know, not put athletes on a platform, but actually realize that they are humans. And mm-hmm. my entire approach to journalism has been um, human first, journalist second, human first, athlete second. Yeah, and and I know that you've talked about um, because I think if you speak to people, human, to human. Mm-hmm. yeah. Sorry, you go. No, I was gonna say I I was gonna say I know you know, you 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 reference. Um, the uh, Beyond Blue 
website on your podcast quite a bit. And I was just going just gonna to mention that I have the Beyond Blue and the Lifeline. I have links to those in my show notes every every episode, um, just because it's and it's, I think it's partly because of me having done this podcast for the first year during lockdown, where most of the people who are listening are 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 in Victoria. Uh, the vast majority of the people that do listen are, are in Australia. So, and it just yeah. So I mean, that was always sort of my approach to things, and um, and yeah. So when I decided to have my own little project, I thought, well, why not just give it a go and do it? You know, I've got the relationships with a lot of athletes um, and the reputation, so that when people don't necessarily know me, they at least um, know the kind of work that I've done. And um, yeah, it's it's been a really fulfilling project of, and I'm always surprised by the amount that people share with me and how much they trust me to share their stories. But I just think if you can humanize athletes and use their platform as a way to start conversations and change the narrative with the everyday person, it's it's a pretty powerful um, way to use sport. Now, would you, uh, you know, one of the other great interviewers has stepped down from his position, Mike Sheehan, having stepped down not long ago, if you were ever approached with the opportunity, whether, you know, maybe with channel seven, I'm not sure, not going to delve into other things there for a long format type interview show like that. Is that something you would love to get back involved in doing there as well? Yeah, for sure. And I think there is a thirst for long format interviews. Um, and there's so many different platforms these days. I kind of like, I mean, TV is almost my first love because I love the audio visual nature of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do love the intimacy that podcasting provides because I find that people listen to podcasts when they're by themselves. So they consume it like they're part of the conversation, whether it's driving in a car or going for a walk or working out at the gym, it tends to be a really intimate format that they really pay attention. Um, and it really, yeah, like I say, it becomes, you become part of the conversation instead of just somebody watching a, a screen tuning in. So I do love um, that it provides that sort of format and I do love the fact that I have just this the tiniest little um kit that I can take anywhere so I can go into people's homes and it's not setting up lighting for an hour beforehand Mm -hmm. and you know you kind of you're aware of all the lights cameras action whereas podcasting gear it's you know hold a microphone and chat for an hour yeah that's I mean I'm using about a 70 dollar microphone and an eight-year-old laptop so yes exactly I know exactly (laughs) what you're talking about there yes so a couple things before, before we wrap up here and I, 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 I've kept you for, you know, some time here, you know, I was going to ask you before, besides game of Thrones, what show would you recommend? Uh, <laughs> you've already done that. I, I have, the family. <laughs> yeah, I, I have, I have one that I would recommend for you and it's another HBO show. And I think it's, it's one, if you ever have a, uh, I'm not sure how your, your mom is for, for different types of television, but it's an HBO. If you're watched a show called the wire. My brother used to rave about this um, mm-hmm. and I, I never actually sat down and, um, and watched it. But yeah, I mean, The oh, Wire is. is known to be the one that changed television. It was oh, it sort is. of the one that, that along with The Sopranos uh-huh. kind of led to all the others. Yes. Well, The, the Wire, I think just from the, the psychology standpoint, I think it's one that you, know, you and your mom could sit down and just watch this and just delve into the, just such a complex group of characters in that series. Just absolutely fascinating. So, you know, I have a couple just little, you know, different types of questions here. If you're getting ready to plan your own, your own music festival, you, you, Narrowly Meadows is planning your own music festival. What, what three bands are performing? Oh, see, this is, this is tough for me. I'm, I think the greatest invention ever is Shazam because I'm such a lazy listener, but I love music. So Shazam just changed the world for me because um, it's right there. <laughs> like you can okay. just Shazam it and then it's in your playlist and you don't have to pay attention to to who's uh, singing it and what song it is. But okay. I would probably say I desperate, I really, I mean, they're an Aussie band, but I really want to watch Gang of Youths live. Oh, I was. Um, I thought you were going to say the Wiggles. Actually- I thought you were going to say the Wiggles. <laughs> <laughs> gang of youths i would i would say um I, you know what i'm gonna go for let's go for aussies 
because I'm loving her music at the moment. Lil, uh, not particularly well known, but Alex the Astronaut, she's got great tunes at the moment. Um, and I'll give G Flip a, a shout out as well. So three Aussie acts okay. to go with. Okay. Keep it safe in, in COVID times. Okay. Good point. Good point. So what is your biggest pet peeve? What's the thing that just irks you the most? Hopefully Lack it's not that question. Sense. Okay. <laughs> lack of common sense. I, I, I really struggle with lack of common sense. Um, but also, uh, I, I would say when I was in hotel quarantine in Australia, I know in the States you drink bottled water for whatever example, obviously in India, I have to drink bottled water at the moment. You don't, you don't um, have but to, but you could lose, you could lose your freshman 15 if you don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And then, um, um so yeah, uh, in Australia, it's so safe and clean and mm-hmm. delightful to drink the tap water, and it drives me crazy when people drink bottled water at home in Australia. I understand sometimes you're out and about and you need it, you need some water, right? Right, right. But people who drink bottled water at home in Australia, um, I just I think that's so bad. And in hotel quarantine, they give you bottled water every day in mm-hmm. Australia, and I made a point of just refilling my bottle all the time from the tap and leaving all the bottled water on the, on the bench for whoever the next person was. Right, right. I just think that's appalling. There's yeah, nothing yeah. wrong with our water in Australia. And I think it's in the same in the States. I don't really understand why everyone in the States drink bottled water. I think it's just a habit that people got into and it's not cool. Well, it's, you, you have to, you have to applaud the, uh, the advertisers that convinced you to pay, a buck and a half for something you could get out of the tab for free. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. what like at what cost to the globe? It's so well that bad. yes, that's yes, that's true too. Yes, that's and I knew that's they knew that's where the vantage point was you were looking from there. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was the approach you were taking on that I'm there. Shaming so. you. You'll go you'll go and throw out all the <laughs> so you'll never buy it again. You'll go right well, straight to the tab. <laughs> well, no, I I generally do tap. So I'm uh I good, good when, when, I, I, when I was in the Navy, you know, we were drinking coffee that was the coffee came in a 50 pound can and two hours earlier, the water was in the Indian Ocean. So I, I don't get too concerned about, <laughs> about it all that much. So um, I, I, I ran across this question and I, and I just thought this was this was just such a, a really interesting question. I said, if, if you're in, if you happen to be in a room with all of the people that you've met in the world. Who's the only one you're looking for? Who are you trying to find in that room? Uh, my my best mate. Okay. Um, yeah, she's she's um, my best mate, Erin. She's basically like my sister. Um, she had some challenges growing up, and she just became part of our family. And she is out outside of my you know two brothers and my parents, and you know my niece and nephews. Now that the mm-hmm. the family's expanding, she's yeah, the most important person in my life and be totally lost without her. That's fascinating. That's, that's fantastic. What are you going to call in your fact, the other day, somebody, somebody asked me if I could have um, dinner with three people in the world, uh-huh. you know, that, that old question, who would it be? Mm-hmm. And I, I said it would be Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, and then my best mate, Erin, because I want to experience it with her. And that way yeah. we can go and talk go about, talk it about it. There you go. There you go. Okay. What are you calling your autobiography? Extraordinarily, surely. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That that's it. Okay. And uh, you know, I don't know. Your your quarantine has lasted a little longer than you thought. It's now April of twenty thirty one. What are you doing? <laughs> um, probably the same stuff. Talking to my family making podcasts <laughs> okay <laughs> okay hopefully okay. the technology is advanced by then that we can we can we'll, do some extra broadcasting we'll, from hotel rooms we'll we'll be hot we'll be holograms just like uh princess leia we'll, we'll go back exactly. to the 19 19- yes exactly okay now i i had a, to wrap this up and this is the last last thing here um Harper and Lockie, when you, you had a chance to talk to them with from the Where Do We Begin podcast, and again, you know, I, I I didn't realize until after I'd been talking to to him that he he just turned eighteen years old. That that young man you spoke with a couple months ago, 
is just, you know, is, is a terrific, uh, is just really, really into what he's doing there. I had a couple Dockers related questions I wanted to ask you before we wrapped up here, just to see how you're, whether or not you get to keep your membership card or not. Okay. <laughs> so what are, who are the Dockers mascots? I wouldn't even know. Oh. Johnny. I, mean, I know that my niece, I know that my niece got a photo with with the female one though a couple of weeks ago okay. watching the the girls play. But we'll, we'll count I mean, that I as don't a correct go answer. To Rio home games very often because oh. I haven't lived in Perth. Well, that's for 11 that's, years. that's you know what that's that's fair. That was not a fair well, question to ask all you. All I know is that is that the the bloke Frio mascot looks like Clive Waterhouse. Okay. So. <laughs> Johnny and Jenny, yeah. Do- Johnny and Jenny Docker, or what they call, there, there, they call you that. there you go. Yeah, if you telling me doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'm clearly, I'm clearly not a real fan. No, no, that's uh, no, you are. You most certainly are. That was, <laughs> that, was, that was a dumb question on my part. That was just that was a ter- <laughs> terrible question. I shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> so, I, I heard you mention this name recently, so I know you're going to get this one. <laughs> Who was who was the who was the Dockers captain before Nat Fife? Well, I mean, there's Matthew Pavlich, and then we've got David Mundy. There you go. Stepped in, and then Fife, and yeah, yeah. outstanding. So Mundy did it for a year, I think, yep. and then handed over to to Fife. Kind of the caretaker oh, then, God. yeah. So. Do you know who the Dockers' number one ticket holder is, and why isn't it you? I don't know who it is at the moment. Okay. Um. <laughs> Which, first of all, I had never, I had never even heard of that that term that As they actually that, cl- that clubs even named a number one ticket holder until just a couple of weeks ago, and now it's yeah, popped up I, everywhere. It's funny. I always joke that I'm the GWS. Um, number one non-ticket holder because I, I quite like GWS. I lived in Sydney when they came about and I'm friends mm-hmm. with a lot of the players there. So I'm, I'm the GWS number one non-ticket holder. Like they're not my <laughs> first team. But right, right. <laughs> um, I've got a soft spot for them. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I know that like Eskimo Joe was once. Um, yes. <laughs> really yeah, no, you're, you're right. That, that name did show up. A, a gentleman by Dr. Richard Wally. <laughs> there you go yes uh you were so. enlightening me about all these, <laughs> all these important facts yeah so i i, I won't ask, i won't ask you the last one then because it was it, it it's um it's one that i've been asking other folks about other clubs and i it's not fair to ask you that since you've not been in perth for quite some time <laughs> so if you want i have no shame in not knowing the answers uh, to these well questions. you know you know what it's funny you mentioned that because you you said during that interview uh, a couple of years ago where you said that and this is the, the teacher in me really and this and i promise this is the last thing here I, you you t- when you were talking to will anderson you said something that you said you love to lose arguments yeah because you learn something new from them something. Yeah, yeah i just as a teacher i thought that was just was just fascinating because I teach government. That's uh, that's that's what I've been doing for twenty seven years. And uh, and you mentioned how you know we tend to listen to respond rather than listening to understand. And that's it's. I I I'm going to play that that segment of your discussion with him in class because unless there was a little swearing, I don't know. Maybe I won't. Um, <laughs> No, I don't think I swore on you. No, why don't I think don't it, it wasn't you. I guess so. I, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can just go, oh, you know, Aussies. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's true. I I like losing. I like learning. Um, I like hearing different points of view. And I, yeah, I have, I have no shame in not knowing stuff, really, especially at this age. Um, I think when you're younger, you try to know know everything or mm-hmm. um or pretend you know everything but as you get older and more comfortable in your own skin and more comfortable in your own profession i think you you find it easier to put your hand up and go oh, i didn't know that yeah that, that makes complete sense that makes that that yeah there's there's plenty that i i don't have a clue about and it's maybe because i'm forgetting it not that i not that i didn't <laughs> know it at that point in time but i want to thank you for 
taking this hour with me today. I truly appreciate it. This has no been a lot worries. of this has been a lot of fun. I I'm I can't thank you enough for helping me grow an appreciation of footy. And uh, you you've got you've got a, a huge fan of your podcast here, and it's one that I I recommend to my um, the gentleman who teaches psychology in uh, the building where I teach as well, just because it's just some fascinating interviews. And I and I I truly truly thank you for coming on today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hopefully the sirens here in Mumbai haven't ruined off of the podcast here. No, but well, I really appreciate your kind words no, and, uh, and for reaching out. No, I, I, I thank you. They're not the wind chimes from that last interview you had done, though. So yeah, <laughs> I, I was going to send him a note back and say, I'm, we're going to find out just how good of an editor you are and see if you can get the wind chimes out of the background there. <laughs> <laughs> But no, that was that was fun. So, ladies and gentlemen, my uh, my my guest for the past hour has been Nearly Meadows, and uh, again, thanks so thanks so very much. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks. Thanks again for you having bet. me, friends. I hope you had as much fun listening to this episode as I did doing the interview. It was an absolute blast and a great time, and, and I cannot thank Nearly Meadows enough for fitting me into her schedule. I, I think she is a godsend as an interviewer. Okay. I, I really do. And as I've said, if you're not listening to Ordinarily Speaking, and I will put a link to the show in the show notes, you absolutely should be listening to it. If you care about the lives of the athletes that you cheer for, or even some of the ones you cheer against, and you want to see what's going on in their lives, and what has led them to where they are today to become the athlete that they are. And I'm just going to be upfront with you here. The trials and tribulations that many of them have faced, the, the individual she's talking to here, I think you're going to have a whole newfound respect for, for them. And as I mentioned in the episode, you know, the, the Adam Trelore interview that she did had me hooked. You know, I'm, I am not a, I was not a Magpies fan at the supporter or at that point. I'm not a, uh, a Bulldog supporter now, but I am an Adam Trelore fan. And I, I think that that gentleman is a phenomenal young man and I wish him nothing but the best going on. Now, folks, don't forget, if you got an idea for a show topic or if you know somebody who you think would be a great guest on the show, or maybe it's you that would be a great guest, go ahead and leave me a, uh, an email on the website or at uh, yankonthefooty at gmail.com or leave me a voicemail up on a yankonthefooty.com and send me a DM on Twitter. Tell me about who the guests should be. I'd love to reach out to them. I've got a few irons in the fire uh, of some of some great guests that I'm hoping to be able to talk to here in the very near future. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting those, those interviews uh, up for you to hear. I'm closing in on like my regular episode 100. I mean, I'm getting really close right now. I have not counted my live episodes as numbered episodes, but I think if I did, I'm within an episode or two of number 100. And I, and if you asked me last year, or if you asked me in 2019, are you going to have a podcast with 100 episodes in it? I'd have thought you were crazy. But here I am, 17 months into it, and I'm uh, I'm closing in on that number there, okay? Remember, you can find... All of the episodes of the podcast at a yank on the footy.com. You can also find it on your favorite podcast uh, provider. I do have my YouTube channel up and running. I've got to get a, got to get some episodes up to date on there. I'm a little behind on, on YouTube. I've been busy with some things related to school and, and that such and that sort of thing. Uh, the saga of my car, I should tell you that. Uh, they're still trying to find parts to put my, my van back together. For those of you who haven't listened, uh, to the episode where I talked about my van, I leased a van. I basically, it's like a long-term rental, uh, for three years, uh, back on the 31st of March. I drove it for four days, drove it a total of 33 miles, parked it in front of my house it's Saturday night before Easter and some drunk hit it at about 4:45 in the morning on Easter morning. He must've been out looking for eggs. So it's been in for repair for now going on a month. And uh, it's such a new vehicle, and it's one that's imported from Italy. It's actually built in Italy. 
that they're struggling to find the replacement parts for something that's so new because it's it's almost like, well, nobody's going to break one of these quite yet. And well, I figured out a way to do it. So been struggling to find the tie rods for the the uh, the front end of my van uh, anywhere in the United States. Supposedly they found two out of the four, and supposedly two of them are going to be on their way to the uh, repair facility within the next couple of days. I may have my van back next Friday. The people there have kept me informed. Uh, if you happen to be in Sandusky, Ohio, uh, that Snyder collision over there on Old Railroad, they do a great job, I hope. Yes, they do. I've uh, I've seen their work before. So, folks, enough about that. Um, I hope, like I said, you consider giving me a review. You could do that on Apple Podcasts. You could do that on my website, yankonthefooty.com. I'd love to let you know, love to to find out what you think about the show. What what am I doing well? What could I work on this better? What guests would you like me to see to to see me get on the show? Okay, I'd love to have that happen. You could do that in a voicemail. I don't know if you'd want to put the guest information in a review though. Don't forget you can also reach me by email at yankonthefoot at gmail.com and on Twitter at yank underscore on and on Instagram and Facebook at a yank on the footy. You can also find the podcast on YouTube by searching my name, Craig Wessels, as I'd mentioned before. Okay. Please consider signing up on the mailing list so I can get those episodes out to you as soon as they come out. And also with the live episodes, if you're on the, the email list, I will send you a link directly to your email so you don't have to hope to see it in Twitter or on Facebook or Instagram. It will show up in your email saying, hey, there's going to be a live episode at this time. And I've been pretty good about getting signed on right at that point in time. Now, folks, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. We're fans of our clubs. We love our clubs. We're supporters of our players. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so very much for listening. Please consider sharing the podcast with your friends and family. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, may your dribble kick never hit the post. I will catch you later. This has been episode number 90 of A Yank on the Footy. Don't forget that you can reach me at yank underscore on or at a yank on the footy gmail.com. And you can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at a yank on the footy. Again, thanks for listening. And please consider sharing a link of the podcast or the website, quite frankly, with your friends and family. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>